Hey, good evening and welcome to tonight's Tuesdays with Tim. I am coming to you live from the Sanctuary of Wayne Presbyterian Church. Things are set up a little bit differently as we anticipate Saturday night's concert with the Wayne Oratory Society Orchestra. Uh, this Saturday we'll be performing live two works for you. Uh, the first being Mozart's Symphony in G minor, number 40, and then also Aaron Copland's iconic Appalachian Spring. And so I'm excited to be with you tonight to both talk about the composers as well as to explore a bit of their music and their themes in preparation for this weekend's performance. So the concert will begin with Mozart's Symphony 40. Uh, Mozart, to recall his dates, late 18th century, was born in 1756 and died at the young age of 35 in 1791. Towards the end of his career, um, he wrote three symphonies together, numbers 39, 40, and 41. 41 was the iconic Jupiter, but in the middle of that set was this particular symphony, the G minor, um, which is, we know specifically of that compositional time because at this point in his career, he was keeping a catalog of his works and when they were being composed. And so he made an entry about this work on July 25th, 1788. So three years prior to his passing. Now the initial version that he wrote uh, did not include clarinets. It was scored for one flute, two oboes, two bassoons, and two horns. Um, later on, he did actually revise that and he, he added clarinets for the sonority and revised the parts, which created confusion over the years until a score reconstruction happened in 1930. But he basically divided the oboe part uh, for the colors uh, between uh, both oboe and clarinet. So now let's talk about the context in which this was written. Uh, 1788, um, Mozart's actually in a period of time in his career where Vini's audiences were less eager to actually hear his concerts, his recitals. Uh, he had just premiered in the past two years um, Don Giovanni and the Marriage of Figaro, mixed successes. He was having bill, financial problems, bills are piling up, and actually had um, the passing, the loss of an infant daughter, Teresia. And in some of his correspondence to friends, um, we see that he's finding it difficult to get out of some of these dark places as he's dealing with these different issues. And some musicologists would suggest that perhaps that influenced the nature of this particular symphony. And so as I stated before, he actually started the three symphonies concurrently, 39, this one 40, and then 41. And what is sort of unique about this one is it's only the second symphony of his that he composed in a minor key. If you look back in his catalog of works, they are all in major keys with the exception of one other G minor symphony he composed years prior. So as he was beginning to uh, begin this project, um, he started writing a series of letters um, with his own just personal agonies in there where he's asking a friend uh, for financial help. And in that correspondence, he mentions a series of concerts that are about to begin at the casino next week this being the Vienna Casino, and enclosed a pair of tickets for the friend. But we can't find any actual evidence that these concerts ever took place. We suspect perhaps there weren't enough folks who were interested in coming to that event that it got canceled. So at this point in his career, Mozart really is not concertizing on his own in Vienna at that point. Now the other thing happening at this time in history that's uh, influencing German and Austrian composers uh, is the, the intrigue, the draw to the Sturm und Drang, the storm and stress movement, a uh, particular school of thought that's affecting artists and writers. And so in response to this, composers are beginning to write works that are more audible expressions of angst. Uh, Haydn wrote a Sturm und Drang symphony, frequently also in the key of G minor that Mozart uses. Uh, so did Johann Christian Bach, youngest son of the great Johann Sebastian. Um, 
and the younger Bach was a, a strong influence on teenage uh, Mozart as well during Mozart's extended visit into England. So we're not surprised that Mozart is suddenly turning to minor keys. Now a little bit about this storm and stress movement. It's a German literary movement, uh, late 18th century, and it was exalting nature, feeling, human individualism, and it was seeking to overthrow the Enlightenment cult of rationalism. Goethe and Schiller began their careers as prominent members of this movement, and those who followed this movement were especially influenced by the thought of Rousseau, as well as uh, Johann Georg Heyman, who held that the basic varieties of existence were to be apprehended through faith and through the experience of the senses. So let's turn to this symphony and uh, dig in a little bit to Mozart's music. Now Mozart typically, as I was saying earlier, was composing in major themes. Um, we hear that a lot in his piano sonatas where there's a, a cheerful quality, a whimsical quality, a playfulness to it. For example, the B flat. Just a little sigh motive. He repeats that idea. Sighs again. Whimsical chromatic. So, one example of his earlier style. The other one, the famous C major. Again, just a little turn in there, a little playfulness. runs off into his scalar passages to resolve the cadence. So this is what we would call stereotypical Mozart, what we're used to hearing. So what's happening in symphony number 40, G minor? So it starts differently in that you'll just hear um, in the first movement uh, this churn in the violas, this little figuration. Just a motor rhythm figure that's just you know happening underneath. changing slightly, a little heightened tension, and that sets the tone for this. Now, Mozart uses a very typical form. He uses sonata form, which really comes in three parts. You have the exposition, you have the development, and then the recapitulation. Oftentimes, there'll be a short coda to bring the movement home. And so this is a commonly used form um, of this time, of using this within a symphony. And so the question or the intrigue that always comes into play is, you know, how does the composer write in the constraints of the form? And so usually there's some kind of conflict created between two themes or two key areas. And as we go through the movement, we hear how those are developed, how they're utilized, and ultimately which theme wins. So with this one, you know, again, you have that churning started, and the strings introduce a very different So again, kind of a dark color, diminished chord. An interesting interval there coming down. Who's playing with color. Where does it end up? And then in, in the interjection of the woodwind, affirming the cadence. settles for a minute and it starts again and he continues with that theme idea developing it through the opening section he continues to morph it he comes then to a cadence a cadential point a pausing point and so when he arrives here so we arrive 
arrive at a solid major key, and he gives us a pause, and just a slight pivot, chromatic, leading us into the second theme. And the thing that's interesting about this theme is it starts in the woodwinds, passes to the strings, who pass it back to the woodwinds, who pass it back to the strings, as it's revealed to us. So you get the woodwinds coming in, and then the strings pick it up. And then the chromatic nature. And then the woodwinds take over again. Kind of a typical motion by Mozart, but then passing it back to the strings. Passing back to the strings. Chromatic. And then churning. Almost as where am I going to go with it? Where am I going to go? It's not sure. And he starts building. Finally resolving. again after an interjection. And so he continues with this idea and develops it between the woodwinds as they pass notions of theme one. Meanwhile, underneath it, you continue to have uh, theme two appear, and then he brings back just fragments, interjecting the idea of theme two into the rhythm. So he continues to play those two themes against each other until he comes out to a cadential point. And again, the woodwinds all come in to affirm that we, yes, are going to have a cadence. But then, somewhere else, somewhere else. And then the woodwinds tell us that something different is going to happen. Where are we ending up? Suddenly we end up in a very different place, F sharp minor. Now he's shifting keys again. Where are we going? Shifting again. Unusual interval. Almost like he can't decide where are we going to end up. And at this point, the lower instruments of the orchestra take over. Taking the theme. Trying to establish a key area. But he continues to move it. Passes it back up to the upper voices. The lower voices come back in. But the violins come back. So Mozart leaves us unsettled. We just never really arrive. He keeps moving through key areas. again, just working off that motive, and he continues to move us through a chromatic journey, where will he lead us next? Finally, we come to the recap, the recapitulation, the return of the themes, so we've been meandering, uncertainty, the key area continues to shift, and suddenly we hear coming back... The woodwinds lead us there. And then the strings come back with the same material as the opening. Leading 
us back to the original material. Again, we hear both themes are developed through this section as they battle towards the end, passing between parts. Again, he continues to build us up harmonically. Just the sequential material, where are we going? asking the question as you keep hearing these re repeated figurations happening, building this urgency or an anxiety, depending on how you want to hear it. And then we come back to theme two. continue to be back, passed back and forth between woodwinds and strings. And finally, he continues to bring us back. We hear snippets again of the opening theme. Being passed between the various woodwind instruments. The violins even take the cue for a moment, trying to join in. still not towards the end. It continues. The urgency. And then finally, the last reiteration, the woodwinds remind us again. And finally, the orchestra joins in. The journey's beginning. And suddenly we, we shift gears into the second movement. And then Dante, a slower movement. This one happens to be in six. And the thing that's interesting in this one um, is hearing the repeated nature, the repeated notes, um, and how that affects the nature of uh, this movement. So you hear the violas start. Almost a starkness. Second violin, chromatic underneath. First violin. Then a little snap rhythm. And then he sighs. Dissonance. A flat against A natural. Partially resolving. And then the neat characteristic of this movement is this little snap figuration introduced by the violins. Sigh. Cadence. And then we start with that repeated figure. Repeat the note. Interesting harmony spread out. Second violin gets it in on the act. Dissonance, a little snap, moving to resolution, but then the psi motive appears underneath. get above their own longing melody. And so he continues to develop those two ideas to start the andante. There's a sort of somber feel to that, but there's also, for my taste, my ear, a sense of hopeful longing. There's a sense of, again, becoming, a building towards something but it just hasn't been revealed to us yet. 
And so he continues to explore those ideas where he passes the snap figure between the woodwinds. And again, very chromatic. And then jumps it all the way up to the flute. The bassoon takes it back. Meanwhile, underneath, you keep getting those repeated notes from the, uh, the strings. Where are we headed? Seems like we're building somewhere, but it's not quite launching yet. We're waiting for it to happen. Continuing to build until we finally arrive at a cadence. He finally cadences out of that section and introduces a new seed. Again, half steps, not necessarily characteristic of Mozart, a little darker. And he continues to build and develop using the, sm the snap motive, continuing to passing it through. And he continues to destabilize us a bit. What key are we in? Until finally we hear the emergence of that opening theme, viola. And the A material returns. Almost a comfort to hear this again. Changing up a bit what's happening underneath. Theme's the same. But she continues to build going through the A material. And finally at home, he brings us back with a little whimsical feeling, sort of reminiscent of the, the B flat sonata. But he comes here. snap, the flute, and then a half, but resolves. He then leads us into the third movement. This is a minuet trio. Um, so the form, you're introduced to the minuet idea. In this case, it continues in G minor. It's a bit aggressive. Yes, introduce the chromatic. And then dissonance again. Moving around, where, where do we settle? settle here. And he leaves it open there. So again, an aggressive theme. Very angular. Chromatic. Hear that. He just comes right down the line. So an angular, robust minuet theme that he introduces to us. And he continues to explore key areas with that, passing it between the woodwinds you know, as he moves to a major area. Developing. But always, again, this little seed of uncertainty. Is it going to resolve? And ultimately, he leads us to kind of this momentary respite. It's, um, he settles into a major key in the trio. Uh, he introduces the horns uh, in a more prominent role. Um, and it's kind of that bright spot. It's your little pastoral for a moment where the strings start. 
thirds. Which then the woodwinds pick up the oboes, again a pastoral instrument. And the flute or lute. But again, just a little, where are we? Put a little more typical Mozart here. And then interestingly, he passes it to the bass. to the opening minuet. This then leads us to the movement that probably really captivates musicologists the most. Um, the fourth movement, um, well, to give you a couple context on it, uh, Stanley Sadie, um, editor of the New Groves Dictionary, came out in the 80s at that time, that edition, called this the most fiery symphonic movement that Mozart had composed. Uh, Albert Einstein uh, is quoted as calling it a fatalistic piece of chamber music. Why? Why do folks say this? Well, for Mozart, who again I mentioned earlier died at the age of 35, perhaps this is a preview of what's coming in Romanticism. Because we know Mozart the classicist, going back to that. Uh, that's the sound of Mozart we know, the classical, basic, chordal structures, you know, and suddenly here we're in a totally different land, you know, that's really, you know, Beethoven's about to explode onto the scene, and so somewhere in Mozart's evolution, this comes out. And so in this movement, uh, Mozart presses harmony in a way we don't really hear anywhere else, almost as if he's trying to blow up uh, tonality. Uh, if you know the name Arnold Schoenberg, uh, 20th century composer, um, known specifically for that, basically eradicating a sense of harmonic center, where he used tone row theory, the 12 notes, to you know, establish you know, his writing style, which was the most extreme other end of tonal music, going from tonal, early Mozart, atonal, Schoenberg. And so suddenly we hear something radically different, especially for that time. Our 21st century, e century ears may hear this differently. Uh, and so ultimately it's up for the listener to decide. So again, similar to the first movement, he again uses um, sonata form. Uh, this is a break from tradition. Typically the closing uh, movement of a symphony at this time would be using a rondo form. Rather, he goes through the three parts, the exposition, development, recapitulation. And then once again, it enables him to put two themes against each other. And so at the start of this, we hear this more angular theme coming out of the violins. And then he builds on it, and again, hear the crunch. Very diminished. Repeats it. He meant to do it. And then he launches in. So really establishing that key, real sturdy, very intentional. Meanwhile, above all that material, you know, you hear the woodwinds affirming, yes, you know, this is the key, this is what's happening here, um, as we hear this crunch. And they just keep chipping in, very adamant about trying to establish a key, even as we hear this. Degree of doubt entering in. So again, Mozart sets us up with that theme, and then he moves us into a new idea, sort of sweetness, 
Uh, and the secondary theme happens later. Still chromatic again. But we're used to that idea, we've heard that. Woo, coming right down the line. So he begins to develop that idea. Almost a sense of hopefulness in it as it's moving more to a major mode. So then he continues to pit these two themes against each other. And as I said earlier, we again come to the end of the first section of the exposition. A rather confident ending. Then the whole orchestra together shifts gears. angular again. Remember that when we get to the Copeland. Still very angular. Where are we going? The woodwinds try to give us some guidance. Are we going here? So we'll end here. Ah, different again. can't make up his mind. Where are we going? So then the lower the ch uh, lower strings, cello comes in trying to set a path. But again, still, we just can't quite find a resolution. Can't find our way home. And so he continues to build on this idea as it passes between the parts, between major and minor. it up down below, minor, and we'll end up somewhere else again, always not quite settling, so he continues to press us through multiple key areas, and then we get to the page where if you could see my score clearly over my shoulder, it seems like everything has an accidental. Everything's sharp in this section. Where are we? And then he continues to lead us through multiple key areas, creating that sense of angst. What's happening? And finally, we return back to that original opening theme, uh, the strings once again, the violins. Which he continues to build us on. He brings us back to then the second theme as well. seems to be settling for a moment, but we have that rhythm, still just pulsing, dotted rhythm. Pure chromatic. Hear that one again. Very interesting how he brings that back. So the theme which we think is going to resolve, chromatic right up to restart it. Here, G minor, all chromatic, half step, half steps, half step. What's going to bring us back home? We'll find it. it. Continues to lead us through that section. The themes are battling. The key area starts to settle down, but we still have these moments.
resolve. He's leading us somewhere. And then similar to the opening part of this movement, the woodwinds again try to provide us grounding. They're like, this is a good idea. Stay here. But not yet. So then again, Mozart keeps moving us around. Meanwhile, underneath, trying to provide stability again in the lower voices. Certainly, all of a sudden, one G minor. D major. A powerful piece, a powerful exploration of harmony, some incredible themes, but themes that challenge us nonetheless. So we'll open the program with this. Um, a lot of this reminds me of the tumult of the past year as we've continued to navigate COVID, the pandemic the social isolation, you know, there's a very introspective piece that takes us on you know, a journey that, you know, is reminiscent of what perhaps we've individually experienced as we've gone through these past months, this past year. And it brings us uh, forward to Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring, you know, a, a piece of hope, a piece of promise. But before we get to all that, we need to talk about how this particular work came to be. The backstory um, I find very compelling. So the first name I want to introduce to you is the name Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, uh, born October 30th, hold that date in mind, October 30th, 1864. Uh, she grew up in the Chicago area. Uh, father was a very successful um, uh, manufacturer and she was a very accomplished young musician. Uh, she actually appeared with uh, the early formation of what ultimately became the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. That orchestra was founded in 1891, and her father was actually an early sponsor of that orchestra. Now, in 1891, same year the orchestra was founded, um, Elizabeth marries Frederick S. Coolidge of Boston. He's a physician. And ultimately, in 1901, they moved together to Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Now this is out in western Massachusetts in the Berkshire Hills. Now in 1915 her father dies and this is the beginning of Elizabeth's philanthropy. So for example for my Yaleys out there, Sprague Hall at Yale University, their music building, uh, she donated the funds for that. Later on after her mother passes uh, she creates, she endows, I should say, a pension fund for the Chicago Symphony. In 1916, she organizes the Berkshire String Quartet. And from 1918 to 1924, she's sponsoring an annual Berkshire Chamber Music Festival held at that point in Pittsfield. Now, that name should sound familiar as you know about the Berkshire Choral Festival. You know about Tanglewood, which is located just south of Pittsfield in Stockton. I actually had the privilege of exploring that for the first time uh, summer of 2018 and being on the campus of Tanglewood and the barn where the performances happen. They throw open the doors to the fields uh, and truly in an idyllic setting to take in chamber music. Now, in 1925, uh, she creates the Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge Foundation, which is going to build an auditorium complete with organ for the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It opened in October of 1925. I've read varying accounts of the cost. Some say $60,000, some say ninety. dollars That puts you in the tune to $1 to $1.3 million in today's dollars. Now, part of that foundation's 
I should say the main part of that foundation's purpose is to support the music division of the Library of Congress to conduct music festivals, to give concerts, of which still continue today. You can find that on their website. Now on that Library of Congress concerts page, Lizzie, as she was affectionately known, is quoted in a letter to her son Albert from February 20th of 1924 saying, no one should live as you and I do without devoting a part of opportunities to the world. Now this foundation, the Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge Foundation, commissions numerous chamber music works. This was her primary passion. Solo work is supported, orchestra work is supported. This niche of small chamber music making is her particular passion. And let me just read down a list of comp composers from which the foundation sponsored compositions. And I'll tell you before I read this list, I pared this list probably down by a third for the most recognizable names. Samuel Barber, Bela Bartok, Ernest Bloch, Frank Bridge, Benjamin Britten, Aaron Copeland, George Nescu, Howard Hansen, Roy Harris, Paul Hindemith, Arthur Honegger, Norman Lockwood, Giancarlo Minotti, Olivier Messiaen, Darius Milhoud, Francis Poulenc, Sergi Prokofiev, Maurice Ravel, Atarino Respighi, Ned Roram, Arnold Schoenberg, Igor Stravinsky, Randall Thompson, Virgil Thompson, Hector Villa Lobos, Anta Webern, you get the idea, a tremendous amount of music produced as a result of this foundation. In 1951, she was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So that brings us to this Appalachian Spring work about its origin story. Found an interesting article entitled Between Memory and History by Carol, o Carol Oja and Judith Tick. And in there was a great quote uh, by Siren Kierkegaard. And I love this. Kierkegaard writes, it is quite true what philosophy says that life must be understood backwards. But that makes one forget the other saying that it must be lived forwards. The more one ponders this, the more it comes to mean that life in the temporal existence never becomes quite intelligible, precisely because at no moment can I find complete quiet to take the backward looking position. So Appalachian Spring uh, comes on the tail end of a period where lots of music is being composed uh, in a time where artists are engaging politics, but they're doing it carefully. This isn't just happening in America. If you think back to November, the Carmen Suite project uh, that we presented, ballerina Maya Plisetskova and husband composer Rodion Shishedrin, and that particular arrangement, but also her life's work of challenging uh, the Russian officials of censorship. So too are artists in America trying to engage this. Now Copeland is one of those who uh, negotiated, we'll say, a landmine of labels. He's trying to avoid being specifically put into a box. If we talk about 20th century music, uh, we talk about the isms. Everything is an ism, nationalism, um, neoclassicism, you know, you go down art history, literature, all kinds of isms, um, serialism. And so we look at this and uh, we hear some commentary uh, per Copeland, uh, which gets a sense of what were folks, what were his contemporaries uh, viewing of him. Uh, one political historian writes, by its very nature, political vocabulary is unusually ambiguous and flexible. Whoever shapes public understanding of the labels thereby shapes the nature of political discourse. Or we can pop back to Kier Kierkegaard, whose words open this introduction, once you label me, you negate me. So in this time, as authors are all considering, you know, what is the meaning of American within uh, politics, within style. Um, again, you have the rise of jazz, you have Tin Pan Alley, you find these elements mu uh, fusing into classical music. Uh, Martin Brody treats the term as a philosophical category, a focal point, uh, which 
uh, Copeland tried to engage these great aesthetic questions of his time. So by comparing Copeland's thinking with that of Sessions, Berger, uh, Brody illuminates some of these style decisions as well as posing a radical question that's indirectly articulated by Copeland. What were the prospects for a national music culture in a nation of immigrants? Who are we to be? What are we to sound like? You know, what is our arts? What is our expression? Questions we're still asking, I think, today. So if our volume resonates with tensions inherent between past, present, looking backwards, forwards, then are we responding to Copeland's cultural mission? You know, and in Copeland, you know, we hear this kind of pragmatic optimism. Uh, philosopher John Dewey has a great quote who wrote in 1934, to be fully alive, the future is not ominous, but a promise. It surrounds the present as a halo. But all too often we exist in apprehensions of what the future may bring and are divided within ourselves. Art celebrates with peculiar intensity the moments in which the past reinforces the presence and in which the future is a quickening of what is now. So who is this Aaron Copeland? Son of Jewish immigrants from Lithuania, Russia. Uh, father arrives and changes his surname from Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N, to Copeland. Aaron is born in 1900 in Brooklyn. For those of you familiar with that neighborhood, it's the Washington Avenue neighborhood, or Southern Bedford, which is now known as part of Crown Heights. His parents ran a small department store. They attended an Orthodox Jewish congregation. Parents are described as being observant, and Copeland himself would self-describe as a secular humanist. He generally tried to avoid religious themes. Jewish synagogue music is reflective in his style, though. And he also focused a lot on instrumental music, which meant he could use more abstract or neutral titles. But in his early compositional years, the 1930s, critics drew comparisons as to one of that of Copeland as an Old Testament prophet, and even how he would alienate audiences. He self-described his 1929 symphonic ode as Hebraic, with this idea that he had of the grandiose, of the dramatic, and the tragic. So what were the critics saying? After his premiere of Connotations for Orchestra, it was composed for the gala opening of New York's Lincoln Center. One critic wrote the following. For the majority of the audience, all over 35, if the ladies don't object to the sweep of the statement, it was totally evident that Copeland represented an assault on their nervous systems, which they resented. It's strictly accurate to declare that an audience paying $100 a seat and in a mood for self-congratulation, again, a gala opening for the Lincoln Center, and Schmoltz hated Copeland's reminder of the ugly realities of industrialization, inflation, and Cold War, which his music seemed to be talking about. Another famous voice, Leonard Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein, excuse me, who first encountered Copeland uh, via the Copeland's um, piano variations. Those were composed in 1930. Uh, Bernstein gives the following account of meeting Aaron Copeland at a concert in 1937. And he says, I could empty the room guaranteed in two minutes by playing this wonderful piece. I had just learned by Aaron Copeland, whom I pictured as sort of a patriarch, Moses or Walt Whitman-like figure with a beard because that's what the music says. It's hard as nails as Moses was hard as nails with his tablets and prophesying and shattering those two tablets of the law and then trying again. I had this kind of connection in my mind between Moses and Aaron and so I was shocked to meet this young looking, smiling, giggling, Quite a contrast 
from what we're about to hear. Copeland was known amongst his friends as, you know, the rule follower, as one of, you know, staunch principles of self-discipline, but then he also found himself absorbing, I think, uh, the sounds, the sights, the experiences in New York City, the jazz that was developing at that time, which brings us to Appalachian Spring. So this work was actually premiered at the Coolidge Festival in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. on October 30th, 1944. This was the 80th birthday of Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge. Now, the characteristics just mentioned by Bernstein showed up, you know, particularly in, his, in Copeland's piano competition, uh, compositions. You know, and in there, again, is this commitment to social justice, world peace, you know, his interest in varying nationalisms, his rejection of religious rites and orthodoxies, and his aestheticism, again, that severe self-discipline and avoidance of all forms of indulgence. People would hear in his music this, you know, both the declamatory, the idyllic, the agitated, the sardonic, and yet the visionary. And so three examples of those traits actually show up in Appalachian Spring. One could call this probably the work's choreographer, Martha Graham, uh, suggested for the general mood of the opening of the ballet that the composer draw upon the opening of the Bible, the creation story. Now Martha Graham is a well-renowned uh, ballet choreographer. She approached Copeland specifically per this project. They dialogued for over a year back and forth via letter trying to come on what is the story going to be. And so as she's working on this notion of the opening of the Bible, creation story, uh, she's even planning at that point to intersperse spoken excerpts from Genesis into the opening section. And in here, Copeland uses some of the simplest materials to evoke a sense of deep poignancy and purity. I think one of the quotes I really appreciated about this work is Dika Newlin, where you have these wide-flung sonorities, that just gradually dissolve into nirvanas. And so let's tap into this for a moment and hear more about Appalachian Spring. Now in the foreword of the work, um, they write specifically what is the scene that they're trying to capture. And so directly out of the score it is written, the action of the ballet concerns a pioneer celebration in spring around the newly built farmhouse in the Pennsylvania Hills in the early part of the last century. The bride-to-be and the young farmer husband enact the emotions, joyful and apprehensive. Their new domestic partnership invites. An older neighbor suggests now and then the rocky confidence of experience. A revivalist and his followers remind the new householders of the strange and terrible aspects of human fate. At the end, the couple are left quiet and strong in their new house. And so what's interesting here is we start to see an evolution in Copeland's compositional style. There's still an angularness about it, but suddenly you see jazz influences coming into play. Um, as he starts this piece, it's a simplicity. Clarinet comes in. Simple, the sun rising. Stacking chords. So right here, he now introduces you to one of his compositional styles. He takes two chords. He takes an A chord, and then the fifth, the E chord, and stacks them together, which just creates both a jazz quality, but it's kind of an ethereal one. Again, almost asking a question. Meanwhile, then the woodwinds keep echoing this idea. 
As he develops it, he continues this relationship of a fifth, a D chord, and then we add on top of that a C, excuse me, an A chord, and then like before, that E chord comes back in, and he just keeps rolling them. This is wash of sound. sun rising, the start of a new day, the promise of hopefulness, where life is leading, but yet there's questions, there's uncertainty, and then we have the clarinet coming back, just reminding us, it's okay, a new day will come, we look forward. Maybe in the stillness we can also look back. And so he starts us by building us into the start of a new day. to it because despite the tonal tensions we can also just relax into it because that moment of peace that hope that looking out that American spirit that we can take this on and right after he, he sets that mood, we suddenly shift into one of those famous themes out of this. This is almost, again, this is very Americana. Uh, it's the splash of cool water. It's the, you're awake and suddenly you're chasing the day. And he just comes down. And suddenly we start passing through these chord progressions. Starting to build up the wash, the momentum, the energy, but he keeps coming back to, uh, let's see. And we're going. And now he plays with that theme throughout. And again, And for just a moment there, we start catching, you know, another aspect of his style. Uh, when we talk about music, tonal music, we talk about thirds. That's a stack of thirds. And what we hear in Copeland is really stacks of fourths, chordal harmony. And it creates that sense of yearning. And that also results from mixing two chord shapes together. So it creates an excitement amidst what we're hearing. So he develops this theme, this a wake up, we get going, super energized theme. He keeps working through it, keeps coming back to it. And yet underneath it is that promise of sun. Static underneath, solid, a foundation. It's just a sense of building where momentum is coming. We're moving in a direction. Hopefully we know that that direction is. Sometimes not, and that's okay. day keeps coming. Again, that figure keeps happening, reminds us where are we.
And now we finally find some steadiness. The bride and the groom preparing for what's to come as they embark on life together. The steadiness. And yet above them, a fragment of that sun, they set out. journey together. So then we move ahead and uh, we're introduced to a new idea, a playful theme. Uh, it's kind of reminiscent of uh, Rodeo. Um, you remember that? That whole theme. And then he stacks it in, again, chordal harmony. So we get into that idea here. A little playfulness. A little whimsical. You have to smile when you hear that dance. The joy is in the unknown. And so again, they begin. That theme is explored and developed, passed through the parts. And then all of a sudden, we jump into this even quicker section where we're in. And suddenly, we're moving ahead, and we become aware time is passing. It's passing quickly. That can be a scary moment when that realization happens. It creates an urgency. What's left? What's undone? You know, and you hear that in this movement as this continues. Scurry, hurry, keep going. And yet in this, you get that jazz influence. city streets. I don't know where I'm going, but I gotta get there quick. And so we continue to build and develop on this idea. to build up that tension in the chords while continuing playing with that theme above, the hurry, the scurry. And it continues to build up until suddenly we run into a wall almost. It slows down. What's happening? And then it appears, that theme, that chordal harmony. Slow down. Enjoy each new day. Look back. Don't just look forward. A rhapsodic remembering of what it's like that fresh day in front, laying in bed, thinking about what you may need that particular day. Because you know in your heart, but only if you stop long enough to listen. Promises there. And so he continues to explore these colors for a moment. These beautiful chords spread out wide as you see from my hands. So he 
continue to wait. And we get reminded one more time. That new day. And that's when we move into the iconic theme that this work is known for. A simple gift, a simplicity of life, a simplicity of a moment. How can you not smile when you hear that theme? Just there, awash with colors. Very simple. It moves us down a half step, maybe even richer key of G flat. And we move forward, ever evolving. A playful spirit starts to develop underneath as the strings are pizzicatoing. A playful spirit, simplicity. But of course, urgency has to creep in again. started in A flat, went to G flat, and suddenly now we're in C major. Again, this key of promise, of hope. You hear this in so much of Western European music. Somehow we always end up in C major. So we continue, and we finally get the richness where it fills out. to a prayer-like section, almost a moment to pause, reflect, give thanks on what has happened. And then we find ourselves coming down to the end where one more time he brings us back to that simple theme in the flute. Calm, still, breathing. Just really easy colors. ships, but steady, moving forward, lifting. comes back from the beginning. New days are coming. Look forward, but don't forget to look back. We get that one last build from the strings. Straight C major chord. Then he adds that fifth of a G chord on top of it. Sounds. And the flute, 
hearkens away. back to the Kierkegaard quote, which I opened the discussion about this particular piece. After that journey, hear once again these words of Kierkegaard. It is quite true what philosophy says, that life must be understood backwards. But that makes one forget the other saying that it must be lived forwards. The more one ponders this, the more it comes to mean that life in the temporal existence never becomes quite intelligible, precisely because at no moment can I find complete quiet to take the backward looking position. I wanna thank you for joining me this evening for this exploration of two incredible pieces of music. I'm excited that we'll be bringing these two Saturday nights I hope you'll tune in live to enjoy them with us. Uh, the link will be in the description, um, but they'll be uh, broadcast live on YouTube. But uh, both an exciting concert, but also I hope a concert that brings you promise and peace as we continue to emerge from this pandemic. So I thank you for watching tonight. God bless you, and good night.